Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world right now. It's Whiskey Wednesday. It might be Thirsty Thursday if you're on the other side of the international dateline, but be that as it may, welcome to the Whiskey Wednesday webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. I'm Mark Gillespie in the WhiskeyCast studio in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Hope you had a great weekend and a good start to your week, and I hope you have a dram handy. We're going to have some fun for the next hour or so. We want to uh, encourage you to put in your questions, comments, and feedback. You can do that uh, on the various chat forums, whether you're watching on Facebook, Periscope, or YouTube. You can post your questions, and we will see them and be able to feed them to our panelists. If you're watching us on Twitter, take it easy. Don't respond to the tweet with this video clip in it, because uh, we won't see that one until after the show. It's been an interesting uh, last few weeks in the whiskey business. And uh, before we get to our panelists, and I do need to bring you an update. We had a story on this week's podcast about the, uh, the World Championship Bourbon Barrel Relay that uh, takes place each year during the Kentucky Bourbon Festival, which would have been held this week had it not been for COVID. It was rescheduled as a virtual event for a month from now in Bardstown, Kentucky, with all the events online except for one. They were going to do the bourbon barrel relay with teams coming in separately, uh, socially distanced and uh, socially distanced and and uh, running their relay heats and having those timed. But uh, we got word the other day after this podcast had gone out that. Uh, the distilleries were a little bit nervous about actually doing that because it involved bringing people from different shifts together, even though they were all going to be coming and competing separately. So it has been decided that the uh, the Bourbon Barrel Relay Championship will be canceled for this year, and uh, Heaven Hill will remain the champions overall, men's, women's, and Robbie Mattingly and Ashley Cundiff, the individual champions for one more year without having to defend their titles until spring or the summer, September of 2021. So we wanted to bring you that update. Let's bring in our guests now because we've had a lot of rebranding going on and a lot of new debuts as well over the last uh, few weeks. Let's start off, first of all, let's bring in uh, John Laurie from the Glen Turret Distillery in Scotland, the managing director there, Matt McKay from Bimber Distillery in London, and Jacob Call from what you probably knew until yesterday as the OZ Tyler Distillery in Owensboro, Kentucky. It is now known as of yesterday as the Green River Distilling Company. So welcome, guys. Uh, hope you're all having a good day, and we'll have uh, some fun here. Let's start off with uh, what's in your glasses. And Jacob, I know what's in your glass because I've got some of it, too. So why don't you tell me what's in these two glasses? Sure. So this is a, a barrel pick um, that I did of one of our older barrels that we had produced. Um, it is a, a three-year, nine-month uh, Kentucky bourbon whiskey. Um, with a 70% uh, corn, 21 rye, and nine malted barley mash bill. And, um, you know, we think it's uh, got a lot of potential, and uh, this will be the liquid that will be in uh, the first Green River uh, bourbon to be released uh, in 2021. Sometime, what, what, I believe about March of then or next year or something like that? Uh, what's the plan? Yeah, we're working out those final details, but... Uh, in that, in that range sometimes is what we're looking at. Let's uh, talk, first of all, well, let's go around the table here and get the other drams. Uh, John, what's in yours? And I know you just introduced it today, right? Indeed. Yeah, so I have the new Glen Turret 12-year-old. Um, so in Scotland, we call it Dundee cake. But uh, to explain, it's kind of a fruit loaf, fruit cake with walnuts um, and a bit of lemon zest. So very... It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful dram. I fell in love with it the first time I saw it on the table. And Matt, what's in yours? I'm assuming it's a Bimber as well. Uh, yeah, no surprise to anyone. So this is the Bimber Oloroso uh, Cask Batch 2. It's our latest release, uh, a UK exclusive of a previous version that we released for the European market that sold out in a snap. Um, so due to the demand there, we've released this one uh, just for our friends in the UK. Um, and yeah, it is a about three and a half year old English whiskey, and it's been finished in Oloroso casks for around about four months. 
We already have a great comment on here from uh, Dave Kuhn, who wanted to suggest that uh, wanting to come up with a name for the people who join these this webcasts regularly. And I'm not even going to go with some of these suggestions. I think cast holes keeps coming in, and I'm not sure how I feel about that one. But you guys come up with a name for something for yourselves there if you want to. Uh, evening cast holes from Pete Head and uh, all sorts of fun stuff. But let's just... Uh, Let's go into why we're seeing, why you guys are doing rebrandings and revampings of ranges right now. And it deals with a lot of acquisitions and uh, not just facility acquisitions, but IP acquisitions, right, uh, John? Yeah, so ours was an acquisition uh, in March last year. We were acquired by uh, a group led by the Lalit group, so the Luxury French Crystal Company. Um, so Silvio Dens led the, the, the acquisition and um, from Edrington and set about repositioning us and bringing in new whiskey maker, Bob Delgarno, who is, is very well known in the industry. And uh, Bob set about creating an entire new range. So literally just today, Mark, you, you joined us earlier on today as we revealed our entire new range to, to the world, new packaging, new design, new liquids inside. Um, it's been a, it's been a busy 18 months for us. So we had the, we had the launch planned for a little bit earlier this year, but with COVID, uh, production was slowed down a little bit. Um, dry goods supplies had, had, had slowed down. Of course, people had to stay safe and stay at home. So we had the decision, do we, do we postpone and move to next year? Or do we move move ahead? And we felt that, you know what, we were ready to move ahead. Our distillery has been around for an awful long time and it's been through worse than this. So therefore, if we can do it and we're ready to do it, then we should do it. And let's see what that new uh, look for the packaging looks oh, yeah. like. Because I know you have a bottle yeah. of it handy there. So let's see yeah. what it looks like. Because we are getting comments from people who have seen it on the internet already. Yeah, so this is the new bottle. It's a 12-year-old. Um, so it's very um, angular and square. Those who know Lalique will, will know that this is a very Lalique style Art Deco. Um, we have a large front-facing white label um, with a family crest in the front with a lot of embossing. On the base, it carries the design by Lalique. On the top, we have the, uh, the crest emblazoned on the, the oak stopper as well. So that's the bottle. Uh, very different. And the bottle carries all the way through the entire range. So regardless of whether you're drinking our non-age statement at the entry point or drinking our 30-year-old, um, you'll get the same weight of bottle, same pouring style. Um, that's really important to us. We didn't want anyone to feel that they were not um, that they were not as important to us as another drinker. Everyone, every entry point going through it is important to us. Um, okay. And this is the, the carton case for all the core range uh, carries that azure blue, which is a new brown color with the, the white front. And Greg in Paris, uh, Greg Serafian has, is asking, is it a design only rebranding or content change too? And with Bob Delgarno coming in, you covered that today uh, during the webinar for Whiskey Reporters that uh, Bob created a whole new range from the existing stocks, right? It's a whole new, yeah, Greg, thanks for that question. And, and nice to see you, Greg, thank you. Um, it's a whole new range. Liquid packaging, labels, brand positioning, the distillery is getting a remake. What's really important to understand is those who know Glen Turret will know that it's known for its traditional methods, its handcrafting of the whiskey and its small batch distillation. And that's not changing. Our new owners have really respected what makes Glen Turret and its soul, and that is staying. So they brought in Bob uh, with his skills and experience to elevate our liquid. And Greg is pointing out how about the limited but great 10-year-old unpeated? He's going to miss that one. You replaced it with a peated Glen Turret. Yes. yes, we did. We did. Um, so the 10-year-old has gone um, out of the range. We have a non-age statement, Triple Wood. We then move to the 10-year-old peat smoke. And if you remember the, the peated edition that Glen Turret used to have, uh, we just kind of felt it sat in the middle. It didn't do anything for the non-peated drinkers and it wasn't peated enough for the peaty drinkers. So we've changed that, and the new peat smoke really uh, really delivers on the on the, on the the peat drinking front. We then move to the 15-year-old, and from 15, we skip up to 25 and then 30. These are available starting tomorrow, right? Correct, yeah. yeah. In which markets, and when does the U.S. get some? Because I know there's this whole 
750 ml thing that you have to deal with, but you've already got plans in the works for that, right? Well, yeah, so uh, to cover that off, we have had some um, some slight delays. So our products ship out to our markets uh, late, either Friday or early next week. So they, they'll be in the markets next week. Um, it'll be available on the Glen Turret website as of tomorrow. Uh, we, we are launching immediately in the UK, France, Germany, Netherlands, and Switzerland. Uh, and New Zealand. Um, we are going to launch in Asia and America. America is planned for early next year. January is our target. And we did invest in the 750 mold from the start. America was always on the cards. Uh, it's a really important market for us, especially in this position. We don't have a lot of liquid. It's incredibly scarce, so we can't be everywhere. Um, but we do have a mold for the, the same bottle, uh, 75 CL and that will be available in the U.S. in January. Jacob, let's go to you now and talk about the decision to rebrand OZ Tyler, which just opened three or four years ago as uh, Green River Distilling Company. What was behind this? Yeah, so, you know, uh, Mark, the Green River um, brand or, or trademark is really iconic in, in the bourbon industry. Dates back to 1885. Um and we've really had our eyes on Green River since the beginning, since we purchased the facility back in 2014. And, you know, sometimes it takes a while for those deals to come together. But uh, I don't want to say it's a no brainer, but uh, for us being able to bring back a historic brand uh, that was the most advertised whiskey brand before Prohibition, to its original site and original home in 1885, that just doesn't happen very often. So for us, you know, it uh, it was almost a no-brainer for us. And you actually worked this out with uh, members of the McCulloch family, right? We did, yeah. The great-grandson of uh, J.W. McCulloch, uh, Rob, uh, still had that trademark and still owned that, uh, that label. And you know, we uh, we worked on them for a while, but, uh, you know, we finally came to terms. So, And to point out, the OZ Tyler name only came in when Terracentia bought the place four years ago. So it was not a historic name. It was actually named for the, uh, the scientist who developed the, uh, shall we say, doohickey that some of your whiskeys are tweaked yeah. with. Well, you know, that's probably a good time you know, to bring up that, you know, we always, we've always distilled uh, our bourbon very traditionally here at the distillery, um, you know, grind our own grains, uh, age it, you know, traditionally, just like everybody else. The terrapure process has always really been just a sort of a final finishing step after that barrel is dumped. Um, so not, not required. We do have several brands that don't use the terrapure process. Um, and I can, you know, assure you or tell you that the Green River product will be completely traditional um, now that our bourbon has come of age. So, will we see a rye version in the near future, or is that too soon to, to tell? And you'll have uh, angry marketing and PR people beating down your door if you tell <laughs> us. We certainly have some uh, plenty of barrels in the Rick House of uh, similar age. Uh, as our bourbon. So I would say uh, down the road for sure. I know you do because I tried some of the wheel horse rye that uh, some folks acquired from uh, your distillery yeah. earlier, uh, several months ago, and thought it was pretty good. I can't wait to see what it comes out with when you guys have it. And Jacob, we have lost your audio again. Uh, I'm not sure if you need to uh, smack your IT person around or what. But uh, <laughs> What about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Matt, let's talk to you now because you have the oldest brand of any of these three right now with your current packaging because, and you're only a year old uh, at Denver. Exactly, yeah, I mean, you're not going to see a, a rebrand from us anytime soon. We, we've only just released a uh, whiskey pretty much a year ago. So we celebrated the anniversary of our, our first release, which was cunningly named uh, The First, um, just this week. Um, yeah, so, I mean, brand, branding and design is something that we do take take as seriously as everything that we do. Um, but yeah, we're, we're pretty new on the block, so, so you aren't gonna see any, uh, any, any new designs or, or new packaging or, 
uh, uh, new styles of, of what we're doing for the time being. I mean, effectively, what you are going to see is us exploring um, the cast that we have as they come to age, as they come to be, you know, three-year-old plus, as the ex-bourbon and the sherry that we have gets a little bit older, and then starting to play around with those more. So, you know, we, we, we're effectively uh, the new kid on the block, and so so we're going through that learning process. So, you know, when John's introducing his new brand, and we've got 15, 25, 30, um, yeah, we've, we've got three <clears throat> and four. Um, so we've got quite a long way to go before we have that you know that 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 ability to have that palette of of different casts, but nevertheless, um, you know the next year I think is going to be really exciting for us because we are going to have um, some of those early casts, particularly things like port, uh, things like uh, that we're playing around with, like imperial stout. So yeah, you're, you're going to see some diversification of our liquid, um, but yeah, no rebrands, no repackaging, no no rebottled designs. Uh, I think those are going to stick with us for a while. Well, let's be fair. Glenn Troy did have a 246-year head start. <laughs> yeah. It's just the brand is current. John's looking really good for that type of age. He's doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me why you guys decided to build the distillery in the Park Royal neighborhood in the first place, because the closest we've gotten is uh, to seeing what you guys have is uh, earlier, a few weeks ago on the webcast, we had Billy Abbott from the Whiskey Exchange on, and he said he could see your distillery out his window. Yeah, because he so lives the, very close to you. So the, the, the whiskey exchange is, uh, you know, our good friends and neighbors uh, just in Park Royal. So in West London, um, our, our story originally begin, begins in Poland. Um, our founders uh, emigrated from Poland where um, their uh, generational history was in was in moonshining. And indeed, that's where the name Bimba comes from in Polish. It literally translates as moonshine. Um, so the distillery was founded in a uh, very picturesque North, uh, North Acton industrial estate, um, simply because that is round the corner um, from our master distiller's other business, um, which is uh, wood turning and woodworking. Um, and that's actually really useful. Um, so although, as I say, it's really picturesque and those who have visited uh, will recognize the you know, the famous North Acton waterfall and forest. Um, it, it, it does mean that we we have got that supply of people who are really skilled at carpentry. They're really skilled at engineering. And they're right, you know, they're 200 yards from where the distillery is founded. Um, so, you know, despite being in, in central London, having that supply of, of people who have those skills, that technical knowledge and having that on tap um, is a really valuable resource. I mean, you've got distilleries who are, who are you know, much longer in the tooth than, than, than we are. And uh, some of them don't have that technical resource right effectively on site to be able to fix something, to be able to recoup or something. So, um, you know, it, it, it's part of the nature of the beast that we are founded uh, near where our uh, master distiller and founder is based. But also it really is a boon to us to have that, to have that resource right. You know, you can literally walk, walk over to visit our, uh, our woodworkers and coopers and that's great. Well, you've, you've got some fans in our audience. Alistair Gray is saying your peated cask is superb and the Bimber spirit is something else. And uh, Tabitha Adams has a bottle of your Bimber Rechard Oak. And she says it's one of the tastiest whiskeys she owns and says it's so lush. We have a question for Thank you, you from Chris Ratcliffe. As a new distillery, how do you start defining what the Bimber house style is? When did you start defining that? Um, so I can't claim any any fame for that one, uh, but that again goes to our master distiller. Um, he he likes several things. He likes a very clean and crisp style because he believes, and I agree with him, that it interacts with the barrels um, at a very young age. So you're getting a lot of extraction and a lot of flavor early doors. Um, but he also quite likes spice. He likes a spicy whiskey, um, and so. In, in defining and in doing those sort of initial new make runs, what he's done, and it, I won't explain our entire process, it's on, on the website, and it is quite quite geeky. And I think that's why some people do like Bimba because we do things in a, a particularly geeky way. Um, but everything we do is to define that style of make, to make it particularly pure, particularly precise, an incredibly tight cut point, throwing away heads, not redistilling those at all. And consequently, getting the style of whiskey, which is is incredibly fruity, incredibly well-developed, but with, in my opinion, you know, a spicy kick, a, a little <laughs> bit of power. So, yeah, I think those people who have tried the whiskey that, that, that we've produced will see those commonalities across all our expressions. Um, but, yeah, we, I, I think we're packing in quite a lot of flavor at a young age. 
John, you guys had to develop a new house style, too, of sorts with Glenn Turret that Bob Dalgarno had to come up with based on the existing inventory of casks that uh, you had when the new ownership acquired the distillery. How did you guys decide what you wanted the new Glen Turret to taste like? <clears throat> so one of the defining factors of any distillery is what is your key style? What is your house style? <clears throat> and some brands will go to casks and maturation process and come some um, will go different directions. Ours is the new make spirit. And we talked about it today, Mark, you know, the, the spirit of Glen Turret has been around for, for many years. And when Bob arrived, he didn't jump in and say, you know, I'm Bob Dogarno. I know what I'm doing. Let me throw together an amazing whiskey and, 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 I'll, and I'll head off into the hills. You know, he, the first thing he did was go into the warehouses and spent three months in those warehouses. And that wasn't a lie on the, on, the, on the call today. He genuinely did. He puts on his overalls and he disappears into the warehouses and he opens cask after cask after cask. And he knows these and he samples. And eventually he starts to build a picture in his head as to what is here, what am I working with? What is the what is the lay of the land? And and that's great. And Bob Dogarno is a great whiskey maker. But the key to Glen Turret is the teamwork between our distillery manager, Ian Rennick, and Bob Dogarno. Because Bob can only do as good a job as the new mix spirit that he receives. So in a handmade distillery, you don't have computers, you don't have sensors, um, Everything is manual valve operated. So therefore, there is a level of trust you'd acquire from the person operating before you that they'll either get it right or they'll tell you that they've not got it right and then therefore allow you to adjust to, to get it back on course again. So that integrity and honesty that comes through that part of the process, Ian produces a new mixed spirit. He and Ball work together the, almost to the level where they're choosing the cask for the spirit run. You know, they are looking at that spirit run and saying, you know what, I think we should go this direction with this. So they're laying down, we, we were on a training course recently and, and we heard the phrase that sums up whiskey perfectly and I hope these guys will understand that. You plant trees, you'll never see grow. You know, they, they're they laying down casks now that actually, you know, we might never we might never drink. They might never be, um, be our productions, but you are making these decisions for the next generation to make sure that they walk into the warehouses and think, wow, these guys have left us in good condition. We have a question for you from Jimmy Steen Rasmussen. Is the new branding forced by all the new distilleries coming? We have seen other new bottles, labels, and boxes. And I'm betting no, because with the new ownership coming in, there were plans all along to uh, really redefine this because Edrington had released Glen Turret malts, but it was mostly used for blending. And we very rarely ever saw single malt official distillery bottlings from Glen Turret. But uh, the new ownership bought this with the desire to create a full-scale brand, which necessitated the repackaging, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. The Under Edrington, we were never a core brand. Uh, the famous Grouse was the power brand that we supported, and we were part of that process. About 50% of what we made went into the famous Grouse blend. But crucially, 50% always stayed in our warehouse before Glen Turret. And the general manager of the distillery at that time was always allowed to brand manage and keep that Glen Turret brand alive, which was essential. And that allowed it when we, the acquisition happened that we had a base to work from. We had consumers who did know what Glen Turret was and, and we really hope that the new spirits, and we talk a lot about how they're very different and we've spent a lot of time to recreate them. You should still see the same signature Glen Turret style in there. It's the same new spirit. It's the same, same coal, same soul in, in there. They've just been presented in a much better way. Um, so, yes, I do think that... Um, our new branding came completely from a new ownership and that was always going to go in a different direction. But if you ask my personal opinion on where all the new branding is coming in single malt scotch at the moment, I think it's a generational thing. I don't think you see this many brands re, um, repackaging at the same time because of new distilleries. I think if you're to look through generations of whiskey, whiskey packaging, you see trends and they move forward. I think we're just at one of those step change points where where brands are moving into their next phase of their, their, their existence. I love this comment from Tabitha Adams when you were talking about Bob spending three months in the warehouses. She'd like to spend three months in a whiskey warehouse. You wouldn't see her either. <laughs> yeah. 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 
And Greg Serafian says, yeah, but bear in mind, you might be drunk at some point just by the smell of being locked in those warehouses. And yeah, Joe, it's not an easy task in the warehouses, especially at Dunnage warehouses where your, your casks are stacked on top of each other. Um, and there are perhaps, you know, 10, 10 long in the rack, three deep. And the one you need to sample is always going to be one in the bottom right hand corner. You've got to take them all off to get into it. Uh, so, yeah, Bob, uh, Bob had... Uh, had gone from you know being in a in an office where he had his samples drawn from and brought to him and he did his job there because of the volume and scale that he was working at. So when Bob arrived, he was back to you know real old school uh, whiskey making. And uh, I'm not going to lie to you, he he dropped a few stone. Jacob, let's bring you in on this because you guys basically rebuilt what was the old Medley Distillery in Owensboro from scratch over a period of. Uh, couple of years between 2014 and 2016 and then started filling up the uh the rick houses with barrels again how did you guys define the kind of whiskey you wanted to make well you know when i when i got here this place had been shut down for 25 years and it was a uh, definitely a train wreck uh, a lot of uh fallen in buildings water damage um and really it it was putting all the puzzle pieces back together um, you know, we had to do everything from electrical to plumbing. We had some tanks that were here. Some of the walls were good, but you know, it was a, uh, it was about a two, really about a year and a half process. We kind of got started in 2015. Um, we started, uh, distilling September of 2016 and we made 18,000 barrels that first year. We went through an expansion uh, rather quickly a year later and uh, ramped up to 70,000 barrels production. And then we finished uh, another expansion in uh, October of uh, this past year that uh, took us to 90,000 barrels of production, um, which makes us the fourth lar largest independent bourbon distillery in the United States. But, uh, you know, it was really... You know, I had my dad come in. Uh, I am third generation uh, distiller, seventh generation Kentuckian. And, you know, a lot of these things are kind of passed down. Uh, I, I told somebody the other day, it's kind of like farming a little bit. You know, it's passed down from generation to generation. And, you know, had a real good idea of the, the mash bill and the recipe that, that we wanted to make. And certainly put my spin on it a little bit. Um, but uh, it's really just kind of uh, a combination of putting the puzzle pieces back together uh, as well as modifying some things. We, we went ahead and I put a, a big copper section, four foot copper section on the top of our beer still. Um, and our copper doublet was good. It was, you know, 1982 vintage, but uh, we had Vendome come in and said we had a lot of useful life left in it. So, uh, you know, it uh, we're making some some pretty good bourbon, I think. So, I don't think there's any argument. I'm not sure what happened there with the audio, but I'm, I don't think there's any argument that you guys are making good stuff early on because I've had some of the uh, the non terra pure process stuff that you guys have made, and it's pretty good. And the whiskey in this is three years and nine months, and personally, I think it's ready for a bottle now. But you're going to hold off till next spring. Explain yeah, you know, why. Well, you know, we just we did just secure that that trademark, uh, the Green River trademark. So, uh, you know, we really want uh, it to be at least four years old. And, you know, we'll probably have different expressions. We have other mash bills. So, you know, we have the, the high rye bourbons. We have the high corn bourbons. I've got weeded bourbon, rye whiskey, uh, high rise. So, you know, we do a lot of different things here. Uh, you know, we do uh, we do a lot of contract distillation for other other distilleries and brand owners, and um, so uh, you know, we we want it to. Uh, if I'm going to put my name on a first release from the Green River Distillery, you know, it's going to be at least four years old. <laughs> and that also is the magic point in American whiskey, where you don't have to put an age statement on it once it's four years old. Unlike a lot of other whiskeys where the age statement refers to the youngest, the U.S. is unique in that, and we're having trouble hearing you again, Jacob. Uh, U.S. requires that anything under four have an age statement so that you know you're getting young whiskey. 
But once it hits four, you don't have to do that unless you want to, right? That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. John, let's go back to you because a lot of folks have been commenting about the tours at Glen Tour because it was one of those distilleries that got a lot of visits because it was the home for many years of the famous grouse experience until the distillery's sale. What have you done and what are you going to do in terms of uh, revamping that to promote Glen Turret now? Well, actually, uh, before it was the famous grouse experience, the Glen Turret received its millionth visitor. So but even before it was famous grouse, it was an incredibly popular tourist attraction. And it was popular because it was the second, we believe it was the second visitor centre open in Scotch. Glen Fiddick were first. Um, so therefore, but we were only an hour to an hour and a half away from Edinburgh and Glasgow. So it was very convenient for people to visit. I think that actually what drives the visitors at a whiskey distillery visitor centre is tourism and not the brand. I think if it was if it was the brand, then you'd see some other names getting really big numbers. But we consistently do 70,000 visitors a year because we're in a great location close to Edinburgh and Glasgow. We're a Highland distiller, very low in the Highlands. Therefore, it's accessible if you want to tick that geography box. We're on the road to Oban, the road up to Inverness, if you go up to the North Coast 500. So that, that drives. Therefore, there's pressure on us to not just be a brand home, but to be a whiskey visitor centre that educates in whiskey, not just on our brand. We feel that is, uh, is important for us. Uh, for us. So we get a lot of visitors, which absolutely love our visitors. Uh, and we hope that uh, Tabitha and Graham, I think the all comments coming from, uh, would, would agree that you get the warmest of Scottish welcomes when you visit especially from Sheena on the desk, if you've been there. What went into revamping the visitor's center to promote Glen Turret and getting all the famous grouse stuff out of there? Sorry, what, the, what went into? What, what, what went into it? What went yeah. into creating the Glen Turret yeah. experience again after some years of it being the famous grouse experience, uh, getting all the, all the grouse stuff out of the place and uh, coming up with uh, a new visitor's center for Glen Turret? You know what? Yeah, that was a lot of work. So removing the big copper grouse from the car park was a uh, was a, a tearful moment. Uh, a lot of the staff are really close to it. The famous grouse is a is a um, heritage brand in Scotland. You know, we it's very close to us. It sponsored the Scottish rugby team. We've seen it. And people love the Christmas adverts when famous grouse is on. Uh, but yes, there's no more copper grouse in the car park. The signage doesn't have famous grouse in it. Even the brown signs, the 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 national tourist signs, if you like, say the Glen Turret now. That was a lot of work, but what was the um, the, the longer piece of, of work was winning um, the staff over to, um, to help them with the research and uncovering the new history so they had the information on Glen Turret to talk about. The famous Grouse was easy to talk about. Relearning the scripts and understanding the true Glen Turret history took a bit longer. Um, so, sorry, I, I skipped your first question a little bit. Uh, what's coming at the distillery? With the owners Lalique, we are now bringing a new Lalique restaurant, Lalique bar, cafe, new shop, Lalique boutique, and that will happen in December this year. And next year, we have brought in the designers Contagious to look at our tour and help us retell our brand story uh, in in a way that we 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 could be proud of. And uh, just one question, where did the grouse go? The big copper one, what happens to it? It's down, it's, so the famous grouse brand stayed with Edrington and they, are, they, they blend that in Glasgow. So the copper grouse went down to Glasgow to, to go where it's actually made. And Tabitha Adams says, hopes the Glen Turret still has the cats. <laughs> you still have the cats, right? Yes, we still have the cats. Inventively named Glen and Turret. Very creative. A lot of yeah. thinking went into that, right? Yeah. And Greg Serafian, does this mean that the grouse no longer has Glen Turret malt in it? Uh, that's something I'm sure you probably can't even discuss since it's not your brand. But uh, I assume there's still some, uh, at least a little bit of a supply contract, is there? So there's no supply contract with the famous grouse. We we keep all our single malt to ourselves as of March last year. Uh, whether Edrington kept enough to keep them going, I, I'm not sure when that blend would change or, or if it needs to change and. Uh, and really, at the end, how much of Glen Turret was actually in the famous grouse, that's you know part of their recipe. So you're right, I can't really comment on that personally, but I can say that Glen Turret doesn't have any private filling contracts. Matt, let's talk about uh, tourism at Bimber, because being right in the heart of London, in the West End and in the Port Royal, and 
neighborhood, you probably get a lot of at least interest in visitors, right? You might think that, uh, but we are honestly on an industrial estate. So, I mean, effectively, if you come visit Bimba, um, frankly, at the moment, you, you, you're a whiskey geek. You, you've you got an idea about what you're going to be getting. Um, you know, it's not far from London. It's only 10 minutes on the Tube West. Um, but nevertheless, you've got to make that journey out of the center, and then you've got to walk through an industrial estate to get to us. Um, so what that means for our tours is effectively there, there is no there is no beginner experience. There is no high, you know, we, we're going to give you a, a quick 20 minute whip around, have a dram and then send you on your way. Um, the only whiskey experience we offer is, is the full the full thing, the full two hours. You'll get all of our attention because, you know, you've made that journey to come and see us. And, and it isn't as easy as it sounds coming probably into London and out of London. And equally, because we do everything, everything other than grow the barley under one roof, you know, all the way down to filling, uh, packaging and shipping uh, in the distillery as well. Um, it's something we really like to show off. We like to bring people in, give them the new make, and then they can see that whole process in one room. Um, you know, there's nothing like going to a big distillery and seeing it at scale. Um, but in terms of understanding how whiskey is made, when you get it all in one place and you can literally say we're moving the liquid from here, here because of this and now you can see it happening um i think people really enjoy that aspect of of getting quite up close and personal to it um but again we're we're, we're pretty small so particularly um with covid regulations and socially distanced tours you know mm -hmm. uh, when when uh, john's talking about his uh 70, visitors um yeah you know on a friday night we'll we'll, we'll have seven to twelve um you know again completely different scale of things so we're very happy providing those in-depth tours for a limited number of people so they come away and they feel they've had this amazing experience but we're just not geared up not nor do i think we want to be geared up to be a you know a massive tourist site uh park, park royal tourism has has yet to really uh, come about and we have a question for you from graham frazier it's got to be hard for you to keep up with the demand as you said you're doing everything under one roof any plans to expand or relocate in the future? I mean, you're only four years old, so uh, yeah, um, you got to start planning an expansion already, right? So yeah, I mean, there's two parts of that. The first of all is that demand, and I and I have to say we're we're pretty we're pretty blown away by it. I mean, you know, it was only a year ago we released our first whiskey. It feels like three four years already. Um, we're filling a cask a day to give you an idea of scale. That's pretty tiny, so. There's this element of, of managing the demand and the interest in what we're producing, but equally making sure that we're, we're just laying down enough stock so that when people say in time, I wonder what a 12 year old bimba tastes like, that we've actually got a 12 year old bimba because if we sell it all now, and it looks like we could, um, we, we'd never have the ability to actually see what the spirit is capable of. And that would just be really sad. So it, 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 is, a, it is a juggling act to, uh, to, to, to manage all that demand that, that we're getting and, and to effectively produce uh, enough um, to, to save people as, as best we can, but to hold on to it. Um, in terms of what plans were, I mean, there were certainly discussions um, around how we might, um, I wouldn't say necessarily re relocate, but um, mm -hmm. in a sort of chichibu way, uh, uh, Bimba B. Um, but frankly, given, given the year that we've had, um, I think we're going to hold off on that for a little while. We're going to we're going to sit and consolidate. We've got a lot of new whiskey to release. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely something we're talking about because we're small. We'll always be small. We'll always be West London. Um, but it's some, something on our minds. But yeah, I, I think 2020 has put, put a lot of people's plans uh, on the back burner. And certainly, uh, don't expect to see uh, to see uh, either Bimba moving or Bimba B. Uh, opening up uh, any time in the near future, uh, but rest assured, we're we're aware that uh, we don't make enough. And we have a, a bit of a cheeky question from Chris Ratcliffe. I like cheeky questions. He wants to know <laughs> if you get many who double up visits with wormwood scrubs. <laughs> not that I'm they admit. I'm not sure what um, wormwood scrubs is, but uh, it's, a, it's a prison. Um, uh -huh. uh, I mean, I mean, it's a good question, Chris. I mean, I haven't actually, as a marketing avenue, tapped into uh, Prisoner Day release, but I, I think there is definitely an avenue there for a, you know, a once monthly Prisoner uh, Distillery tour. What could possibly go wrong? 
Well, you could just say your stuff is warehoused in a whiskey prison. Think of it that way. And we have a, a more serious question from Chris. Where is your whiskey warehoused, on site or elsewhere? Uh, both. Um, we have a limited number of casks uh, in the distillery itself, and those are either the casks that we are, we've are we just filled um, or that we're working on, uh, working on in the sense of they're things that we are monitoring very closely, uh, that we're sampling on a, a weekly basis to, to see how they're developing. Um, or that they're things that we want to keep in the rafters of the distillery where the temperature is higher because we're processing in there. We also have another uh, bonded warehouse. That's where the bulk of all of, of the casks are. Um, being under one roof, uh, when I joined the distillery, it was at its fullest. You, you walked in, you got to the stills, and then you hit this wall of casks, and, and there was nowhere to move. So um, we got to the point where uh, we really had to strip down those casks just so we, we had the ones that we were operating with and the ones we're filling with. And effectively, if it's something that we're laying down, um, we send it off to the bonded warehouse and then we call in the samples when we want to have a look at those casks. Um, but yeah, a, a bit of both is the answer to that question. And you need to do that for safety reasons. You don't want to have everything in one place. Uh, well, well, yeah, I mean, there's that. Um, there, there was, uh, uh, not that amusingly, um, last December, there was, uh, in, in true industrial estate fashion, there was a car fire um, just down the road from a distillery. Um, I was pleased when I came in the next day that uh, we were unscathed, because uh, that's, a, that's a concern. Um, yeah, it's a combination of, you know, safety, not having overloading, um, but also making the distillery simply a workable uh, place to, to be in. Um, you know, if we put all the casts in there, then then people would be under each other's toes and that would be dangerous e even without social distancing. So, yeah, it, it's a factor of, uh, you know, we don't make a lot, but we make more than enough to to, to fill our little unit in, in uh, North Acton. Well, Jimmy Steen Rasmussen says he's definitely going to be looking out for Green River in the future. Obviously, when it comes out next spring. Jacob, how important was tourism to you guys? Because I know that you have had... Uh, You've had what was until this week, OZ Tyler, open for a while now. Yeah, you know, I was hoping we'd get to, to uh, touch on our uh, world famous uh, Kentucky Bourbon Trail a little bit. You know, we of had over, over a million visitors uh, on our on the trail here. But and, do they all uh, get out as far west as Owensboro? Well, yeah, you know, that's what I was going to say. We are the we we consider ourselves the gateway from the west. Um, so we, we do get a lot of people that, uh, this is either their first stop or their last stop on the tour. And, uh, we actually just finished a, a big renovation of our event space that we have a, an event space here. Uh, with our tour, our tour is kind of a, uh, a hands-on tour. And I tell people that you, you might get dirty on our tour or we might put you to work either one. So, uh, definitely a hands-on behind the scene, uh, type of, type of tour here for sure. You know, and, and on our campus, we were fortunate enough recently to, uh, to engage a, a pretty famous artist in the States, a guy named Aaron Kaiser, who has done some amazing work on our campus. He's, he's painted a historic Green River, uh, advertising, uh, the whiskey without regrets on the side of some of our uh, Rick houses and, uh, redone our uh, our entrance sign, and he's just done a really tremendous job. For yeah, us. how did you manage to keep all that hidden from the public until <laughs> yesterday with the announcement? Because uh, I saw some pictures of that big sign on the side of the warehouse, and I'm going, yeah, how did they keep that secret? Definitely the worst kept secret in Owensboro, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we have another question for you also, Jacob, from uh, Greg, uh, his second try with this one. He wants to see some of the bottles that you have behind you because uh, he noticed you have some interesting bottles on the shelves behind you. He was kind of curious about them. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, well, this one, let me grab this one. This is uh, all these little bottles. These are just sample bottles that, you know, some of my barrel picks that I've looked at. But uh, let me just grab this one. This one is uh, Bradshaw. So, uh Terry Bradshaw, a very uh, famous uh, football player. I'm sure a lot of people know Terry Bradshaw. Worked with him recently on a, a bourbon project. Um, so that uh, that just launched recently. And Yeah, tell also, us about that one, too, is when you get done with the other, showing us the other bottles, because uh, we didn't get to do much with that because COVID kind of hit us right after the Super Bowl when that all came out. Yeah, uh, you know, he uh, he had a big bottling run, and, 
you know, Pennsylvania, of course, is going to be one of his big markets and they basically shut the state down. So, but uh, now that things have started opening up a little bit, uh, we are moving some Bradshaw bourbon and, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's a great ambassador for bourbon. He, uh, you know, never met a stranger and, uh, certainly, uh, certainly talks, talks great things about his bourbon. So, uh, what else is back there? Oh, I've got, uh, this one's getting ready to launch. This one's called oh, Yellow Banks. And, uh, this is a collaboration that we did with the, uh, Kentucky Corn Growers Association. So we, uh, we're tied in pretty tight with the agricultural uh, community here in Kentucky and um, really work with them. We, we use only 100% Kentucky corn and uh, put their, uh, their logo on our, uh, on our uh, product. So, um, you know, we're always uh, doing all sorts of partnerships uh, really with green river kind of in the, uh, in the wings here. We've, we've had some time to work on some other projects. We've got, uh, we do a lot of private label bottling uh, as well for some liquor store chains. So this, is, this one is called uh, Quarter Horse Reserve. And we do this in some rather large liquor store chains, uh, ABC in Florida, Evmo in California. So uh, Winchester, Mills and Mash. Um, just What's that one that was two bottles over to, the, uh, to your right, the one on the end there? That one, yes. Greg's asking about that one too. This is a brand new one, um, just shipped out today. Actually, this is Winchester Double Oak, um, and this is one that we finish on uh, with Sherry Cast Staves, and uh, this is actually just shipping out uh, uh, probably this week. So, where is that one available? That looks like something I'd see at Total Wine. It is actually. It is a Total Wine. Mm -hmm exclusive uh we have an arrangement with winchester the, the firearm company and uh, our ammunition company and um you know uh it's really just an exclusive that we do for total wine the winchester brand so we're pretty diversified uh mark you know we we have our uh, our bulk business we ship tankers of bourbon all over the world uh, we do private label business and uh you know we're really we do private brands like for Bradshaw, but uh, we're really excited about uh, Green River. You know, that's a, a new area for us and uh, a lot of a uh, lot of buzz and excitement uh, uh, here in, in Western Kentucky and to get to bring that historic, you know, brand back to life. So we're pumped about Green River right now. <laughs> and Dave Kuhn says that Winchester is probably best taken in shots. <laughs> uh. <sighs> <laughs> yep, that's our audience, guys. Yeah, dad jokes to the everybody here. And Greg Serafian notes how different uh, U.S. whiskeys can be even within the same distillery. How do you make so many different whiskeys out of one distillery and make them all taste just a little bit different from each other? Because that's got to be a, a big challenge because we know that uh, your counterparts can do it with barrels and different finishing casks. but how can you do it with bourbon when you can't, uh, when you have a little more, when you're trying to do so many more different whiskeys and we, different brands? We do it with our mash bills. So for example, the Mills and Mash product, that's a weeded bourbon. So that's a 70 corn, 21% wheat and 9% malt. Uh, we do it with proof, different proofs. We do it with different uh, locations in the warehouse. Uh, we do it with like, the Winchester, uh, the sherry finish. We do it with finishing on the, you know, sherry cast staves. So, um, lots of different, uh, lots of different angles to still stay within the, uh, the bourbon, uh, regulations that we have. And explain how you're able to do that because we all think of bourbon as very tightly controlled in terms of what you can do to it. You can't put any coloring, any flavorings into it, but, for those folks who are outside of the U.S., explain how you're able to put it into, say, for instance, sherry or port wine barrels and still be able to call it bourbon. So so let me tell them the, the rules of bourbon. So it's got to be made with at least 51 percent corn and the recipe or the mash bill. It has to come off our still below 160 proof. We come off about 138. Uh, has to go into a brand new charred oak barrel um, every single time. Uh, at 125 proof or less, 
we barrel generally around 120 for the majority of our products. Um, and it's bourbon the second it hits that barrel. And bourbon can be made in, in any state. Um, but to be Kentucky bourbon, it has to be distilled and aged in Kentucky for a year and a day. Uh, straight bourbon is two years. And, uh, you know, that's uh, 95 percent of all the bourbon produced in the world comes from Kentucky. So uh, that's that's uh, we've got some pretty tight rules around that. So and, you know, if we do finish it with with sherry staves with a particular expression, we just put it on the label. You know, we just have to denote it on the label that it has been finished in sherry cast uh, staves. We are getting questions. How much of your whiskey gets exported? Uh, I don't want to really get into, you know, exact specifics or the accountants will kill me. But uh, but I mean, in terms of which brands, because people are hoping to try to find some of these brands say in Europe and other places where my, what, 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 what might they be able to find? Winchester is a possibility. You may find Winchester because we do export that brand, but primarily a lot of our stuff is in bulk tankers. So we'll ship it over to another bottler there and they'll, you know, put it on their put it in their own label that they may have their own private label product. Um, so I would say, uh, stay tuned. There's probably, uh, be some more of our stuff, uh, overseas soon with our packaging. John, we have a question for you from Pete Head, and he focused earlier, you said that Glen Turret focuses on the whiskey making and not on the brand. And later on in switching from the famous Grouse brand to the Glen Turret brand, he hears a conflict. Please explain. I think we're talking about the visitor's center there because uh, while it was always the Glen Turret brand, it was the home of the famous Grouse experience. When the distillery was sold, obviously it could no longer be the home of the famous Grouse experience. So you had to go back and uh, rebrand everything at site as the Glen Turret. And I think, I think I'm explaining that, but uh, please el elaborate on that if you can. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I really like brands. I think if brands are done right, then a brand should tell you everything about what you're going to get from, from that product. Uh, I think where brands have got a bad name for themselves is where they've misled the consumer into what the product inside would be. So we like to describe ourselves as liquid lead. So we we focus on the whiskey making. The liquid needs to stand up for itself because a nice shiny bottle will get you the first sale, but it won't get you the second sale if the liquid inside doesn't stack up. So we are liquid lead. Whiskey making is our priority. But our brand is gets a lot of attention because it is our personality. And you should be able to look at the Glen Turret and understand what it means to, to be a Glen Turret consumer and potentially what you're going to get when you're drinking inside it. And as long as those two stack up, then that's okay. And we did have a note from Pete Head that he has seen Winchester available in the Netherlands. So that's a good, good point for Greg. And uh, although Greg's in Paris, he can get over there fairly easily once the restrictions just up, um, end up. How has... And this is a question primarily for Matt and John. How has the U.S. tariff issue affected your plans to sell into the U.S.? Because uh, neither one of you are doing it yet, but you both have plans to. And John, yours are farther along than Matt's are. But tell me what the tariffs mean to you guys in terms of being able to sell your whiskeys over here. Matt, do you want to go first? Um, sure. So... I mean, I think the tariff situation is different for John and myself because, you know, it's a different category or indeed scotch is a category and English whiskey might have a category, but but doesn't really as yet. And that's something we're developing. Um, it, it's more a case of, um, again, going back to the early point, uh, Bimba's scale or lack thereof. Um, but we are absolutely looking at uh, some limited releases um, in the US. Um, yeah, I would... I, would, I don't want to put a, a date on it because we haven't done it yet, but uh, it, it, it is in the offing uh, and something that we're working on to make sure our, our, our friends in America can, uh, can get our whiskey because at the moment we are very UK and, and Europe centric. So uh, I, all I'm going to say on that one is watch this space. And I should point out that uh, the way the tariffs are written right now, you guys are off the hook because... Uh, only single malts from Scotland and Northern Ireland, for some reason, are subject to the tariff. Uh, my guess is that nobody told the 
the office of the U.S. Trade Representative that, yes, they do make whiskey in England and Wales. So Correct. you guys escaped that one. And uh, another, well, I can't call this a dad joke because it came from Tabitha Adams. Is Winchester available in Winchester? It's Thank you, should, Tabitha. It should be. <laughs> and, uh, and with almost the first sentence, John, so Pete had you, is that quite, your answer explained to that? Dave Kuhn hates the tariff. Yes, we all hate the tariff. And Pete Head goes, I think you're the best Tabitha to figure that out. If I had to Winchester, I'll have to go into self-isolation. You know, uh, Mark is kind of funny. I keep hearing all these names and, and here in Kentucky, you know, we have a Paris, Kentucky, we have a Winchester, Kentucky, and we have a Glasgow, Kentucky. So <laughs> there's a lot. And of you have a thing. Moscow, Kentucky too, right? <laughs> yeah. I won't say anything more about that one, but uh, let's see here if we have any other, what other questions have been coming in now. I like the bottle design that, John, you guys just released right now. And uh, tell me how your guys came up with that design. Because we're seeing a lot more of those little squared off angular edges on a lot of bottles these yeah. days. I find the way into the camera there. <laughs> so it's like a mirror image. Uh, yeah, so ours, um, we were des it's designed by Lalique. So Lalique's a luxury French crystal company. Uh, it was uh, 1880, it was founded by Rene. René Lalique and Mark Lamino, who is the head of design for Lalique, designed this bottle. Um, he, Mark, like many designers, takes inspiration from, from moments and experiences, and he came up with a design. And actually, uh, his rough concept landed really well first time um, on that angular design without being too masculine or too feminine or, or too traditional. But still being Lalique, we don't want to call Lalique out on the front. We don't want it to be known as the Lalique whiskey. You know, we want it to be the Glen Turret. It's really important to us that that traditional brand gets first and foremost. So that's why it only carries the design by Lalique on the base. Uh, but that way that you, if you know Lalique and you know that Lalique is Art Deco, then you can spot that from the, from the bottle. So it's subtle. How much input did uh, Mr. Dens have into both the packaging and the liquid? Mr. Dens is a, um, a formidable character. He's, I've never met anyone with the, the energy and passion and drive that he has. Uh, so he has an influence on everything, and, and in a good way, in a very positive, positive way. I've only met him once at a, uh, an event for that other brand that uh, Lalique has been associated yeah. with over the years, and uh, not mentioning any names here, but... Uh, yeah, I can see. Yeah, very driven person. But to have that level of success in the business world, you sort of have to be driven. Um, Tabitha Adam points out that the Glen Turret is sort of like a square Hibiki bottle, almost yeah. squared off. And Grant Frazier points out that uh, it reminds him of the new Bladnock bottles. We're seeing uh, that trend with the angular corners on a lot of bottles these days. Um, Chris Ratcliffe uh, says it reminds him both of 209 and Aviation Gin. Oh, yeah. And Bill Ricker, the dad council, will take up Tabitha's application for a dad joke license. <laughs> Crump Crumpler, poor farm for me to be drinking a beer during this. No, whatever you've got handy. Uh, for the record, I have switched over. Um, the folks at Great Drams, uh, Greg and Kirsty, sent over some samples recently, and I had on uh, one of the last shows a uh, tasting note for the 30-year-old Gervin single grain cask strength. And they kindly sent two of these along. So I'm having the second one right now. So a little bit of a cask strength single grain from Scotland right now, which uh, I've always thought single grains were extraordinarily underrated yes, in terms of Scotch whiskeys. And, uh, yep. and you guys are agreeing with me. Tell me what you think on this one. I've tasted some fantastic aged single grain whiskeys. I really have. And I, Green whiskeys get a bad reputation um, when they get put into blends uh, to make them cheaper so that they can be more economically viable. They, um, people associate that with them. That must mean that green whiskey is a cheap whiskey and therefore um, it's, it, that, that equates to less value. But it's cheap because you can make so much of it because there's not the same restrictions on the grain. So because of the volume, you can then get economies of scale. So 
Green whiskey is not cheap because it is poor. It's cheap because you've got a lot of it. And there are some phenomenal, and I think there are some plans to bring out some really good aged green whiskey in the future. And I'd love to see the brands do that. And uh, Greg says he agrees, especially older ones. Matt, go ahead. Your thoughts. Sure. So I, I, I totally agree with John on this one. I, I think uh, grain is often much maligned as, a, you know, sort of poor, poor man's malt. Um, and, and I think a lot of that comes from a lack of knowledge. It comes from, you know, when you look at a lot of distilleries, they're, they're very picturesque. And then you look at a lot of uh, grain distilleries and they look a bit like a petrol chemical plant. Um, <laughs> But if people get to try it, and I totally agree with Greg, some of some of the old grain whiskey is really, really magnificent. Um, and I think it's I think it's an area that, you know, if you do enjoy whiskey, it, it's well worth exploring. Um, and it's also well worth exploring because regardless of the perception of cheapness, um, there are some fantastic good value older grain whiskeys on the market. Uh, yeah, Greg, again, Dumbarton, a great example of a grain whiskey that, in my opinion, matures really, really well. So, yeah, my only advice would be uh, uh, don't believe the lies, uh, give it a go, and uh, you might surprise yourself. And Graham Frazier is watching us from the uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society uh, members room, the new one in Glasgow, and been uh, talking about uh, some of the whiskeys he's trying. Currently, a, a Bunahaven cask strength six-year-old peated dram finished in a Moscatel cask. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Graham. I'm completely jealous right now. Steve Laidlaw, some great grains out there. Girvin, North British, Cameron Bridge. I've had some 45, 47-year-old North British that was outstanding yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> a few years ago from Scott's selection. Yeah. And uh, Tabitha Adams, I think Haig Club has put a lot of people off grain whiskey. Eh, could be. But Dave Kuhn points out that Compass Box's hedonism has given him a fondness for grain whiskey. And we should point out Compass Box is celebrating their 20th anniversary this month. I believe uh, John Glazer has a special uh, tasting going on, I think, later on this evening on uh, online. And uh, we are working to get him on uh, the on an upcoming podcast because he uh, he doesn't want to do the late nights anymore. Um because of the time difference, it is pushing. It's 11 o'clock over there. So we're going to go ahead and start uh, calling it a night right now. And let thank you guys all for joining us. Uh, once again, I want to thank our guests, John Laurie, the managing director of the Glen Turret. And congratulations on your new whiskeys. And uh, look forward to tasting them here very soon. And uh, also Matt McKay from Bimber Distillery. I'm looking forward to tasting your stuff as well. Thank and you, uh, once again, Jacob Call, thank you for this and looking forward to seeing what the uh, the final version of the Green River straight bourbon tastes like. I'm not going to post tasting notes on this because it's still in the barrel, but if it tastes anything like what uh, this is, spoiler alert, I think <laughs> I'm going to like it. <laughs> So, guys, thank you for joining us. Let me uh, Thanks, say goodbye Robert. to everybody here real quickly. And uh, just don't forget to join us on Friday night, the Happy Hour webcast. We're going to have a little bit of fun here. You really want to join this one. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Whiskey, Sam Simmons, and Dave Worthington also from the uh, Adam Brands Master of Malt Conglomerate and the Uncorked Whiskey Sessions podcast. May have another guest or two in there. We're still working on that. That is once again coming up at uh, 5 o'clock on Friday evening, New York time, 10 p.m. London time, 2100 GMT elsewhere in the world. Don't forget to join us for the Whiskey Cast podcast this weekend. And if you haven't listened to this week's episode yet, we went completely nerdy on yeast with Professor Matt Bachman of Indiana University, who is a... Uh, a biochemist by trade. He teaches in the biochemistry program there. Does a lot of research with yeast in terms of fighting cancer and other diseases. But he's also a home brewer and consults with breweries and distilleries on fermentation issues. So he has forgotten more about yeast than most of us know. So if you want to find out more about yeast, well, this is your chance. Thanks again for joining us. We will uh, see you on Friday. Good night, everyone.